Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on evaluation questions and design. This is webinar two of six of the Evaluation Fundamentals webinar series brought to you by AIM Local Health, which is a research project out of the Prevention Research Center at Washington University in St. Louis and is funded by the National Institutes of Health. I'm Renee Parks, the project manager for AIM Local Health and the host and actually one of the presenters for today's webinar. Just so you know, this webinar will be recorded. You will receive an email tomorrow from me um, regarding where you can actually access the recording slides and accompanying materials. There we go. So this webinar series was developed by the Prevention Research Center in partnership with the Brown School Evaluation Center at Washington University and Research and Evaluation at NACHO. The goal is to equip you with greater skills and confidence to develop or enhance your program's evaluation plans. Okay, I'd like to do a little bit of Zoom housekeeping. I know some of you are already familiar with Zoom, but um, I wanna make sure we're all on the same page because we want to hear from you throughout this webinar and that requires using some of Zoom's features. So first, you um, can adjust your audio settings by clicking on the lower left-hand corner of your Zoom window. Please note that you're currently muted. And then we've got interaction features. So chat, and then I just highlighted the, the raise hand feature. Um, and then and then this is across the bottom of your, your Zoom window. And then there's Q&A. Um, and of course, you are welcome to submit questions and any comments throughout the webinar. Um, we wanna make sure that we address those questions. Um, we'll have Q&A portions throughout. And then finally, oh, and this is, this is the, the Q&A. Sorry, I didn't click through that. And then finally, I wanted to just point out the, the view options at the top of your window. So this is how you can your, change your viewing window for Zoom. All right, so I wanna make sure that uh, we're all good to go. We're gonna, we're gonna put that raise hand feature to use. So I would like to see a show of hands. Who has had the opportunity to, well, maybe you joined webinar one, engaging stakeholders and describing the program. So if you joined or you watched the recording and access the materials, will you please give me a show of hands? I'm seeing hands that are raising. Very good, all right, all of you on board. It looks like most of you, most of you. I don't wanna over, overstep, okay, cool. Well, you can go ahead and click your, your um, to unraise your hand, or I can actually lower your hands as well. Good, all right, it's fun interacting with one another. Okay. So our presenters today, it's Peg and me. So Peg is a member of the AIM Local Health Research Team and faculty here at the Prevention Research Center. And Peg, um, do you wanna go ahead and just share a little bit about yourself? Sure, thanks Renee. Hi everyone, it's great to be with you today on this webinar. So I have worked with state and local health departments um, since the 1980s, <laughs> a long time, working mostly in school health, tobacco, and physical activity and other aspects of chronic disease prevention and injury prevention. I've had the great pleasure of meeting some of you through this AIM Local Health Project, and I so look forward to working with many of you this fall and winter on program evaluation. Back to you, Renee. Thanks, Peg. And just a little bit about my background. I think most of you um, have met me, um, but prior to my current position as project manager, um, I spent 12 years working, um, developing, implementing evaluation, health promotion and prevention initiatives in various settings um, at community-based NGOs, and in higher education, and even in the corporate setting. So that's a little bit about my background. Let's go ahead and move forward with the meat and potatoes of today's webinar. And actually, this is a good point um, where Peg, you and I can get off video. We're gonna 
turn off the video just because it can be a little distracting um, and we want you to focus in on the content on the slides. So, all right, well, webinar one really helped us understand who the possible program stakeholders are, the value of engaging them in evaluation, and the need for you and your program stakeholders to have a clear understanding of the program. So now you and your evaluation team need to focus the evaluation, and this includes determining the most important evaluation questions and the appropriate design for the evaluation. So these are our goals for you as part of this webinar. Today we'll cover three main topics, evaluation designs, um, before that, evaluation types, and then we'll demonstrate how you can use your logic model to guide your evaluation questions and how you're going to address those questions. Nancy introduced this framework in webinar one. It's adapted from the CDC evaluation framework and Preskill and Jones. It's really a nice guidepost providing direction as we embark on a pretty complex process. Um, I think it's worth noting that stakeholder engagement is in the center because we know it's so important to get stakeholder input throughout the process. So as we plan and get ready for the evaluation, as we gather information and interpret and use what we learn. Also in the center is disseminating and utilizing results. Um, we need to keep asking ourselves who will use what we learn and how we and others will take action on what we learn. This process really helps us ensure that our evaluation activities and results are useful, feasible, suitable to the evaluation need, and accurate. And I, with the ultimate goal of avoiding that case where you have this beautiful, lengthy report at the end of an evaluation that really gets put on a shelf and no one takes action. And truly, I just I have a colleague who just experienced that and it is really disheartening on, for everyone. All right, so as I mentioned in the first webinar, Nancy focused on stakeholder engagement and really the beginning of this wheel, this framework um, at the top with describing the program uh, with the focus on logic models. We're going to continue with planning and design by focusing the evaluation, which involves understanding the purpose, who are the users, and how they will use evaluation findings. So, Oh, and before we actually get to this, I'm gonna give you a little bit more time to think. I just, we just wanna clarify, um, with regards to this web, webinar series, when we say program evaluation, we really mean evaluation of programs, policies, environmental changes, system changes, initiatives, strategies, intervention, screenings, you name it. Um, so you, you get to define that. We're simply going to say program evaluation. Okay, so I want you, I want to hear from you. So I want you, first thing that comes to your mind, top reason you conduct evaluation. Go ahead and submit your response in the chat box. What's the first thing that comes to mind? and I'm having trouble with accessing the chat. I don't know why. So this is Peg. So I opened the chat and it shows comments such as know where to go next for the funder to determine if a program is effective in changing the outcomes we are hoping to change to determine the effectiveness of a program, part of a grant deliverable, and to ensure the program is effective. Great, great. Thank you all for sharing. And you know, those reasons are really getting at the use or the utility of evaluation. Um, no evaluation addresses all possible purposes or answers all the questions program staff and stakeholders may have. Um, so which evaluation purpose users and uses will this evaluation address? We can really turn to the utility and feasibility standards to help with focusing our evaluation. So if we 
really explore utility further and get at the purpose of the evaluation. This really serves as the basis for our evaluation questions, design, and methods. And then we focus our questions and methods by keeping in mind who will use what we learn and how will this help us focus the evaluation. So our questions will be different if we're going to use it to improve the program versus to justify funding it. And then of course, thinking about what do stakeholders outside of our health department need? So for example, one of your partners is going to apply for a grant to get money to expand the program to more communities in your county. Another example is a coalition member needs to justify to their supervisor why it's worthwhile to spend time helping launch or improve the program. These different stakeholder needs lead to different evaluation questions and methods. And I wanted to include this slide. This was covered in webinar one um, to a degree, but here are some of the users of evaluation and how users would take action on what is learned. I think we hit upon many of those uses, um, but to think about it in increasing partner engagement and um, we've talked about improving strategies um, and influence decision makers to consider if you want to continue or expand a program, um, and then how the program's been successful. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Peg to talk more about types of evaluation. Thanks, Renee. So it may take a moment for the slides to show up. Can everyone see the slides now it, that says types of evaluation on the top? I think we can. Yeah, we're good, Peg. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so next we'll look at information and examples of three types of evaluation. Formative, which asks, will our plan work? Implementation process, which addresses what's happening during the initiative. And effectiveness outcome, which asks, what's the impact? Are we seeing the intended benefits? And you may notice that in the CDC evaluation framework, formative evaluation is included within implementation process evaluation. Here in the webinar, we pull it out separately, really be, as a reminder to ourselves, because it's so important to include as we plan our programs or modifications. In formative evaluation, we get to test out our plans, our messages, our materials, see whether our strategies are feasible. It can show us the preferences of our target population group and how that group tends to get information sources, which is very helpful if we're about to launch a media campaign as part of an initiative, for example. And it can show us whether our recruitment strategies are likely to work. It can show us whether our messages are culturally acceptable, clear, and appropriate in other ways for the intended audience. So we use formative evaluation to clarify and revise our program plans to help ensure that yes, it can and will be implemented successfully so that we get to those intended benefits. So for example, it's so useful as we're planning how to approach a new CHIP priority. In formative evaluation, we typically do individual and group interviews to get people's perspectives on all the things just mentioned. So we use it during development of a new program and when modifying an existing program, when a program has problems with no obvious solutions, and when adapting a program for a new setting or group. So one example would be if we're about to launch SNAP education sessions, and we want to do some media messaging to, to recruit SNAP clients. So what we might wanna do is gather a group of SNAP clients together and show them some draft messages 
so that they can pick out the messages that are the most clear and resonate the most with them that they prefer. And at the same time, we can get SNAP clients' ideas on what would a better message be. Then if we need to, we can rewrite our messages, and if we have time, even try them out with a second group of SNAP clients before we launch our media countywide or citywide. Another example is sometimes we'll do a satisfaction survey. An example of this is a health department sanitarian who started food managers training classes, and the sanitarian chose to do a participant satisfaction survey, not only to get feedback on the class content and length, but also to learn people's scheduling preferences. And in this example, the sanitarian from the feedback received actually set future classes at a more convenient time of day and day of the week, in addition to reframing how some of the content was set. Here's another example. Imagine a school district where many students are overweight, some have prediabetes, and the district already has in place a written wellness policy that includes statements that healthy foods only will be served at school events and in vending machines, but it's really not happening yet. So think about how a nurse or a nutritionist or a health educator might go about planning with a school group to see how can we best get this piece of the written policy in place without hurting school fundraising. So in this example, the school group might want to gather a group of students to get their input on which healthy foods and beverages would be the most appealing and the most likely that they would buy so that fundraising is not hurt or a focus group with a focus group with parents to learn messaging preferences and the group may want to call staff from other school districts to get tips on what worked for them as they worked through this process so now that we've seen a couple examples of formative evaluation. Here's another chance to raise your hands. Please click on the hand raise icon if you have helped plan or do a formative evaluation in the past year. And Renee will summarize what we're seeing. Yeah, it looks like um We've had a small amount, maybe uh, a fifth of our, our uh, attendees have conducted um, or helped plan a formative evaluation. In the past year, and I'm sure if we expanded that out to in the past five years, um, the proportion would be higher. And I think some of the reason why this might be lower than it was in the past is that now our funders are saying, you will choose from this menu of evidence-based approaches. So sometimes we forget that we still need to figure out our own local recruitment strategies and implementation strategies that are going to work in our area. So the funders aren't always funding this piece, but it's still an important piece that we can do as we plan our programs. So Moving now, and please submit questions throughout. Um, moving now to implementation process evaluation. This is where we assess what's happening as we put our program in place and conduct our activities. So we do this type as soon as a program starts and we continue it throughout the program or at least periodically through the program. And it shows us how well our recruitment efforts are working in reaching the group we intend to reach. It also shows us how our other procedures are working out. And as I said, even when we're using a nationally recommended strategy, we still need to learn how our local implementation is going as it's happening and to see what implementation strategies we may need to change to improve the reach.
So this process evaluation set of assessments is so useful in identifying any issues or glitches or problems early on, while we still have plenty of time to make adjustments to make things work better. Here are some common ways we do process evaluation, which I'm sure many on today's webinar have used. I feel like we're particularly good at using tracking logs and doing counts. For example, counting the number of coalition meeting attendees or group session participants. But we often need additional information beyond the counts. For example, it would be very helpful for us to observe the chronic disease self-management program group sessions to ensure it's being delivered in the way it was intended and known to work and to see how it's being received. Or we might do interviews individually or in a group to get target audience and partner perspectives on how implementation is going and, if needed, why we're not reaching the people we thought we would. So most of our funders do require some kind of implementation patient evaluation information from us. And our challenge is to plan to do these assessments early on in our implementation activities and throughout so that we can make adjustments as we go along. For example, imagine a coalition that you work with is proposing a city ban on assault rifles, a timely issue. You might wanna do counts, as shown on the slide, interviews and observations, all three type of methods to learn how things are going while the coalition is building support for such a ban. Then the coalition can use what is learned to shift strategies or add strategies to build public support and city council support. So at this point, here's another chance to raise your virtual hand. Please cl click on the hand raise icon if you have helped plan or do an implementation process evaluation in the past year. And we're pausing and again Renee will yeah. tell us what we're seeing. We've got um, several hands up so about a three in the bunch so Okay, so again, if we asked this over a broader, longer period of time, um, it, um, I'm sure the proportion would be higher, but, um, but that's great. Thanks for responding. Okay, now we'll consider effectiveness outcome evaluation. This is also called impact or summative evaluation. Here's where we assess our progress towards the program objectives and whether we're seeing the intended benefits. Here's where we get to show the value of our program. Through outcome evaluation that are short term, we can see changes in knowledge and attitudes. Before and after our program, we can um, more intermediate timing, see changes in risky or healthy behaviors, or we can see changes in practices of other health professionals that we have just trained um, in a best practice, for example. Or longer term, we can see changes in health indicators or health status. So we use outcome evaluation to adjust strategies to have more impact and to show, as I said before, whether the program is meeting its objectives. So it's not just reports to funders. We really do use it to go back and improve our program. It also helps us make decisions about continuing, expanding, or even ending aspects of our program. Surveys are a main method here, especially pre-post surveys. And to assess actual behavior, in addition to what people report in a survey, we can sometimes get information from other agencies on project product purchases, for example, 
or we can conduct observations or one of our partners can. So for example, in a food desert neighborhood, this could be through observation of neighborhood store, fruits and vegetables offered before and after an intervention. And then from the store's cash inventories or receipts, we can compare pre-post percentages of the purchases for fresh fruits and vegetables. Here are some more examples. Let's say that the health department and our partners are conducting teen suicide prevention classes in the area schools. Short term, we can conduct pre-post surveys to identify changes in students' knowledge and attitudes towards suicide. And a more intermediate outcome measure would be for us to look at the school's suicide attempt rates in the semester before and the semester after the classes. Or another example would be a traffic calming measure near a school. And this is, could be part of a safe routes to school program, for example. So short term, we could look at parents' attitudes towards student walking and biking before and after the street changes that were intended to make walking more safe. We could also observe vehicle traffic before and after, as well as doing counts and then longer range, we could look at the school's rates of prediabetes and injuries. The health department here in Columbia, Missouri, got local funding to launch and lead a three-pronged obesity prevention program that the health department calls Living Well by Faith. And I believe we might have a couple people from um, the Columbia Health Department on the call. So uh, raise your hand if you want to add to this example. Um, in this program, the health department recruited churches into the program and the participating churches agreed to do three aspects, a policy change, such as baking foods for church events instead of frying them, an environmental change, such as a community Community garden and chronic disease self-management classes, only not called that out loud. <laughs> and the health department was able to do not only a pre-test and a post-test, but a number of interim post-tests during the program and afterwards with the class participants and also did church-wide surveys to see if general attitudes had changed. What the program found was, uh, actually, I, if memory serves, I don't think church-wide changes were found when comparing participating and non-participating churches, but the program among the class participants did find average increases in physical activity and fruit and vegetable intake and decreases in blood pressure and wait. And Peg, um, actually Laura from Columbia Boone County Public Health and Human Services just wanted to chime in and mention that um, for their chronic disease self-management um, classes, they actually called them fit, focused, and faithful. Oh, thank you, Laura. What a great name, fit, focused, and faithful. Fantastic name. I think some formative evaluation went into that development of that name, I believe. Absolutely. What a great example. Thank you for sharing that, Laura. Our last outcome evaluation example has to do with the op opioid epidemic that a number of health departments in Missouri are working on. So in this particular initiative, um, staff from the health departments, a school nurse or someone, I mean a, a nurse or someone else, meets one-on-one -on -one with a physician or other health care provider um, and provides education on best practices for opioid prescriptions and safety. And what's listed on this slide are several um, examples of the outcome measures that can be obtained. 
So at this point, go ahead and raise your hand, your clicking on that hand raise icon, if you have helped plan or do an outcome of evaluation in the past, let's say three years. We've got a couple hands raised. Yeah. Okay. And this is also an opportunity. We do want to take a pause at this moment to see what questions you might have about today's webinar content so far. Yeah, so go ahead and submit those questions in the, the Q&A box. Um, I think there is just a little bit, it's more of like a comment about the, the different terminology in regards to um, the types of evaluation peg. So um, I think you already talked about it a little bit, but how um, impact and outcome can be interchanged, not interchanged, but um, sometimes impact is seen as that initial and outcome is seen as that long term um, farther out or vice versa. Yes, and so over the years, people have used these terms in any flip-flopped way <laughs> and in various ways. And so um, they are now pretty much interchangeable. And, and what we do now is really look at the time frame to see are people talking about a short-term outcome or impact or an intermediate outcome or impact or a long-term outcome and, or impact that the terms currently are interchangeable, whereas they may not have been in the past. Renee, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I think it's just really important that there's consistency and clear communication um, among your evaluation team, um, your health department, and your, your key stakeholders. Okay, I think we can move along, Peg. Okay. Thank you. Next, we're going to go over some evaluation designs that are listed on this slide. And as you can see, they move from those that are more simple, low, lower resource, over to the other side of the slide, higher resource, stronger designs. So in our health departments, because of limited resources, we tend to do either the not, mostly the non-experimental designs, which we will go over. But sometimes we do have a naturally occurring comparison group, such as a school that did not offer suicide classes or an intersection without pedestrian safety improvements. And in these cases, we can do quasi-experimental designs with some increase in time and effort, but not outrageous increases. So regardless of our resources, it's best to talk over possible evaluation designs with others to see what, what best fits the questions we want to address and will be most useful to the stakeholders who will be using what we learn, and that includes ourselves. In the one-shot design, we collect data on a single intervention or program, typically after the in intervention. This is sometimes used at the end of a single training or event. For example, a post-survey to assess knowledge and attitudes at the end of a single training. However, and in this situation, there is no comparison group. But much of the time, we're able to do a stronger pre-post design, even with limited resources. So we'll spend a little bit of time on this slide where it says one group pre-post test, because this is the design that we are typically able to do with our limited money and staff time. And this was the design used in the examples shared, most of the examples shared so far. So, if our evaluation question, for example, is, does school-based nutrition education program increase students' knowledge about healthy eating habits, we can measure nutrition knowledge before and after the education. 
So on this slide where it says pretest and post test, it can be surveys, but it can also be um, those other types of things. It can be the product purchases before and after. It can be observations before and after, not just surveys. So that's something to keep in mind. Time series are another set of designs in which we um, collect data sometimes more than once before the program, during the program, and more than once after the program. So an example would be if we're doing a lead poisoning prevention program and we're trying to reduce children's blood love lead level, we may have surveillance data at a small enough community level to be able to use that repeated surveillance data to look at the impact of our program. But if we don't have such surveillance data available at the level we need, um, it does take more money or staff time to repeat the post-test an additional time or two. But sometimes we're able to do this. And when we do have this information, it shows us whether the attitude and behavior changes seen shortly after an intervention were sustained. This can help us improve our implementation procedures to get longer lasting behavior change. The last design that we'll go over is called pre-post test with control group, also called a comparison group. So in this design, which is a very strong design, we collect information on two separate groups before and after an intervention, and the groups do have in different interventions. Very strong design, it does take more resources, it takes more time and effort to work with a school or community site that's not involved in our intervention. But when we have the resources, it's well worth the effort because it will help tell us whether or not the changes we do see are related to the program or are they just because of something else going on in our county or city. So an example of this would be two schools in which that both get nutrition knowledge um, classes as part of their general health education in the classroom, and but only one school has access to a garden. So in the school that has access to the garden, a garden-based nutrition education program is done. But in both schools, information is gathered before and after the program. So it's important to note that in this design, the comparison group does get usual care or some kind of different intervention, not nothing, if that makes sense. So let's go ahead and pause again and see what questions you might have about evaluation evaluation designs, or about anything from today's webinar. All right, don't be shy, folks. Go ahead and submit those questions. Um, Peg, you know, I don't know if this was clear, but I, I'm wondering with the, the time series design, um, can you do a comparison group? Could you have a comparison group? The time series? We can. So we can do the time series design either as a one group design, but with that one group, maybe we do a second, maybe we do one post test right at the end of our program, and then we do another post test six months later. So that we can do that in a one group design, or yes, we can do time series in a two group design. So, so what it shows in this slide is just one pre and post test, but it can be multiple. So yes, we can do time series designs in both one group and, and two group designs. Great, thank you. And I think we can just keep moving along. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you unshare, Peg, so I can share. 
Okay, back to you, Renee. Thanks, Peg. All right, so bring it back, the logic model, yes. So here we have kind of those key components of our typical logic model. Um, and of course, your logic model is an evaluation tool, so let's just take a look at how you can use it to help with your, your evaluation planning. All right, so um, we've got the four areas or do domains in which we can focus evaluation activities, and those are overlaid with where they fall um, with the logic model component. So you can see process implementation um, is going from inputs to outputs, and then um, outcome effectiveness is going from short-term outcomes through long-term. And Peg has talked about those. So of course, um, you know, with implementation, is the program implemented as planned? Were all of the activities carried out as expected? with effectiveness and outcome? Is the intervention achieving its in intended short, intermediate, and or long-term outcomes? And then we also have efficiency. So this is another aspect um, or another area. So how much product or how much is produced for a given level of inputs and resources? And then finally, um, looking at causal attribution. So um, is process on outcomes due to your program or intervention? In public health practice, this can be really difficult to ascertain sometimes, especially for those more distant or distal outcomes. Um, however, determining causality between your activities, outputs, and your short-term outcomes can be accomplished with some effort. So usually surveys and interviews um, or analysis of records can help to establish causality at that level. And the brief time duration for short-term outcomes usually ensures that causal results can be determined in a relatively small amount of time. I think by really using your theories of change to develop your logic model, you can assume with more confidence that those intermediate and long-term outcomes are a result of your short-term short outcomes. So therefore, it's just really key to establish, establish causality between at least the activities and your resulting outputs you carry out and short-term outcomes. Okay, so your logic model can help you identify appropriate evaluation questions based on the program. So we kind of look at some evaluation questions with at each um, level or each component of the logic model. So with inputs, are resources adequate to implement the program? With activities, is the program implemented as planned? With outputs, how many, how much was produced? When we look at outcomes, so at that short-term level, you know, was there a change in knowledge or attitude? Or was that policy enacted? Or did we make that environmental change happen? Um, at intermediate, was there a change in behavior of the system? And then long-term, um, was there a change in health status? And then of course our goal, was there a change in population health status? And from there, it can help you know what information to collect to answer these questions. So that's our indicators, that's what we're talking about there. Um, I, I wanted to highlight this, um, this model. I thought it was really nice. Um, some of you may be familiar with this um, framework or model or the Kirkpatrick four-level model for evaluation of training programs. Um, I just wanted to touch upon this because it can be a really nice way for you and your fellow employees to really kind of synthesize kind of the um, potential effects. So at level one, participation. So number of people reached, the characteristics of those people. And then level two, reaction feelings towards the, the program, acceptance of activities, and then level three being learning, um, knowledge and skills, and then followed by actions, um, the behavior um, that's been adopted by a tar target audience, then followed by system and environment change, environmental change, and then finally health. Identifying your evaluation questions and indicators is a good jumping point to this methods matrix. I really think this is a helpful tool. At least it's a very helpful tool to me um, to determine data collection sources, methods, and instrumentation, um, and even to determine when to collect data. 
I realize there's a lot on this slide, so I kind of want to just walk through a little bit of it. Um, and I have a couple examples. So this first one, um, this is actually based off of a, uh, some evaluation that I did years ago um, as far as physical activity youth development program. Um, so we have on the far left the logic model component. So at the activities level, um, our evaluation question was, you know, is the program being implemented as intended? And so, you know, we were thinking about, well, how are we going to answer that question? Um, and so, you know, we we know what the key elements of the program are. So, you know, we so if you look under, and I'm jumping around a little bit, but if you look under the sample indicators, we identified um, certain key program elements, and we wanted to have certain a certain level or certain marks when it came to that um, to that piece. So, and how how are we going to collect that data? So the methods is through observation of the program being delivered. So we were conducting site visits. So we have the site visit form, um, and that's where you know we ensured that we had those those key program elements and our scale. Um, and then of course our time frame, what was reasonable um, and feasible feasible for our program team to do that was one site visit per per site um, for the program implementation period. So that's an example kind of laid out. You can look at these others. Um, so with regards to another logic model component, the short-term outcome, did the program increase positive attitude toward physical activity as well as self-efficacy to um, conduct physical activity? And um, we, we wanted to know how are we gonna answer that? Well, it would be the number or the percentage of participants who agree or strongly agree on you know, the three items that are assessing attitude toward physical activity as well as ability to do physical activity. And we conducted a pre and post survey. Um, so this is, our source is going to be the participant survey. And um, the time frame. well, at the beginning, so the first session of the program and the very last session of the program. I don't need to read through all of that, but let's go ahead and look at another example. So this came from um, the Spokane Regional Health District and their walking school bus program. So. Um, We've got the logic model component. So one of their act within the activities um, area, they had the evaluation question of what are the barriers to student participation in the walking school bus? And so how are they going to answer that? What are some indicators? Well, they wanted to get the frequency count of reported barriers or those descriptive barriers. So um, how are they going to do that? They're going to do that through interviews as well as records. So getting, they would record um, parent feedback. So the sources for um, that information, be parent interviews, parent feedback received by the walking school bus personnel, whether that would be verbal or written. And then the time frame. this is leading up to the walking school bus implementation and during. Um, and then I'm gonna take you through to the next slide and we can look at a, a short-term outcome question, evaluation question pertaining to that. Um, so did the program increase the overall physical activity of um, the participating children? So that's the third short-term short outcome down on this table. And so what was the, the sample indicator? Well, the percentage of parents who agree or strongly agree that the walking school bus increased their children's physical activity. And um, this, so it's, the method is a survey and the source is the walking school bus parent post survey. And the time frame would be after or following the walking school bus implementation each semester. We'll include this, um, this matrix um, and you may be familiar with others, but uh, you're going to tweak it to, um, to make it work for, for you and your um, evaluation team. We wanted to include uh, this, this readiness scale because, you know, are you really ready to evaluate outcomes? So um, here are some handy rules. Thinking about if there's the political and financial support that exists 
um, really while the intervention is happening, so evaluation can be conducted. Is the actual intervention um, implementation matching the intended implementation? Uh, because that inconsistent implementation makes it difficult to know what version of the program was implemented and therefore which ver version produced the outcomes. When thinking about stability, you know, it's important to know if, you know, if the intervention is likely to change during that evaluation period, it's probably not best to evaluate those outcomes um, because you know, you won't be able, to, there's too many confounding factors to understand which aspects of the intervention actually cause the outcomes. With reach, um, this is kind of getting at sample size. So, you know, is your program reaching a sufficiently large number of people or clients to really use the appropriate um, or the proposed data analysis um, so you can really see, um, see change? Um, or conduct the, or have the power to conduct the needed statistical uh, analyses. And then finally, dosage. So, um, you know, do the people have sufficient exposure to the intervention to result in the intended outcomes? Um, because programs with limited client contact are less likely to result in measurable outcomes compared to interventions that provide more in-depth intervention. All right, so we wanted to give a nod to feasibility standard um, because this can really help with focusing your evaluation. Um, you know, thinking about what stage of development uh, your program is in. Um, so there's roughly those three stages, planning, implementation, and maintenance. And these suggest different focuses. So in the planning stage, truly a formative evaluation, who's your target, how do you reach them, how much will it cost? Maybe the most appropriate focus. You know, evaluation that includes outcomes would make really little sense at this stage. And then conversely, an evaluation of a program and maintenance stage would need to include some measurement of progress on outcomes and also include a measurement of implementation. And then thinking about um, how intensive the program is. So some programs are wide ranging and multifaceted. Others may use only one approach to address a large population, or excuse me, a large program. Um, so some, some programs provide that extensive exposure or dose of the program, while others really are just quick and superficial. And those can be valuable for sure, um, but is it really realistic to expect significant contributions to those like distant or distal outcomes? Probably not. Um, and then also thinking about rele relevant resources and logistical considerations, um, that's obviously going to influence decisions about your evaluation focus because some outcomes are quicker, easier, and cheaper to measure, while others may not be measurable at all. So it, it is going to be important to identify the inconsistencies between the utility aspect um, and the feasibility aspect. Because um, you, you really want to ensure consensus on what is a realistic focus for your program evaluation at any point in time. And a program's desired focus may be constrained by reality. Uh, so the logic model may be key in helping. Um, it can clarify what the key stake stakeholders are focused on. And maybe you have you know, some that are focused on short and intermediate term outcomes, while others are more committed to those distant or distal outcomes. And this is really gonna lead you to um, discuss what's really reasonable. What are the reasonable expectations? And you might have to expand evaluation indicators that include some, you know, some more distal outcomes. Um, because that will keep those stakeholders engaged and have, and those stakeholders might then have a greater appreciation for those uh, short or more intermediate milestones on, their, on the way to their more pre preferred outcomes. Okay, yeah, so we've, we've come to the end here. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, what, what questions you have. And I see there's 
So if we have a specific program that we are unsure how to evaluate, is that something we could contact you for potential ideas and assistance? Um, absolutely. And actually that kind of feeds into um, the next slide and I'll kind of jump, jump there. Um, so I will answer that momentarily. Um, I do want to also say we know that you guys are conducting really great evaluation and you have evaluation plans and examples um, from your counties and cities. And if you're willing to share them, I think that would be very beneficial to the group. So um, you can please send those to me um, and I can put those resources um, within the box folder. So email me, renee.parks at wustl.edu. Okay, I'm gonna, I feel, oh, go ahead, Peg. This is Peg. So I just uh, wanted to encourage everyone to, yes, please send your examples. We have been collecting examples from out of state um, and that helped us develop this webinar, but we would love to be able to share some of your terrific examples. So just want to encourage that sharing. Thank you. Thanks, Peg. Um, I do want to highlight these resources and especially the Kellogg logic model guide because I know we didn't really get to touch on logic models as much as we wanted to, but this guide is really, really great. So I would highly encourage you to check it out if you haven't already. Um, so to answer the question, we would be happy to provide some assistance. That's why this part of this you know, evaluation webinar series and just capacity building in general. So we have this technical assistance opportunity that health department teams or groups associated with a specific program are eligible to receive. So it's just, it's something that once you've completed webinars one through four, um, you're eligible. And of course we want the eventual completion of webinar six, um, but you can take advantage of this opportunity as, as early as late September and then through the end of the project, the aim will call project, which is February, 2020. Um, I know I've been sending out a bunch of emails. There is an online form. So it's a technical assistance online request form. You do need to complete that. And I would encourage you to um, think about this further and go ahead and complete the form. I know we've had one um, health department team recently submit. So um, don't be shy because this webinar is to help guide that process. It's to kind of prompt it to keep it at the forefront. I know you all are very busy, but not but. You all are very busy. And we're hoping this is helpful in keeping this at the forefront and that you can apply these resources, um, this content to where you're at right now with some of your programs. Okay, and then um, please join us for, of course, the next webinar and any of the webinars and in the series.